Hello everyone, this is Glenn Blakeney of Awake Nations Ministries and I'm glad that you have tuned into our first session on our new course called The Power of Deep Roots. And we have several objectives um, that we want to see you fulfill as you study this course. Number one, we want to help you identify any bitter roots that may be present in your life in order that you can uproot them. Secondly, we want to be able to help you understand the spiritual process that uh, happens, is supposed to happen in the Christian life that helps bring transformation to you so that you're conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ so that you can walk in the fullness that your salvation has provided for you, that fullness of liberty that Christ has made available to you so you can live and walk as a son of God. And then we also want to help you um, be able to share your testimony effectively. Testimony that's not just something in word, but a testimony that comes from a heart that has truly been changed. Someone that is anchored and rooted in, in the great grace and love of Jesus Christ himself. Well, we're going to start off the first session here by having you take your Bible, go to 2 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to look at one verse, verse number 30. This verse speaks of the process of bearing fruit uh, and the people of God. So it's, it's a metaphor. Here's what it says. It says, And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. So God says that his people, a remnant people, a people that have escaped, he's speaking of a people that have been preserved. The word remnant literally means a people that have escaped um, a great slaughter, a holocaust, but it also has a connotation of the people that are part of the original, that have been preserved, that have been somehow um, kept intact. So as a remnant people, and that's what you are, you're a remnant person. You know, how many people do you know that perhaps uh, years ago you, you walked with them to the house of God, they were saved around the same time that you were in faith and Yet today, many of those people are no longer serving God. Well, thank God that you are still part of that remnant. You've been preserved by His grace. That's not to say that you did not have any uh, role or responsibility in that. Absolutely, your obedience, your commitment, your persistence uh, is critical to seeing you preserved. But thank God for His saving grace as well. So this remnant, he says, are going to bear fruit. How are they gonna do it? He says they're gonna do it by taking root downward so that they can bear fruit upward. Now, I want you just to think about the Lord Jesus' ministry. When he appeared on the scene, when he was on the earth in Galilee, when he was in that synagogue in Nazareth, the Bible says that he opened up the Bible, or literally turned to the scroll, the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. And it says that the Lord read the first couple of verses, which says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, when Jesus was on the earth, the scripture says in Acts 10, 38, he went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. This was part of his mission. First John 3, 8 says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. But we have to understand that Jesus literally fulfilled this mission with a purpose. And that purpose is found in verse number three of Isaiah 61. Again, remember that Jesus is quoting Isaiah chapter 61. And verse number three says that we would be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. God wants to be glorified in your life and in my life. And how does that happen? We become trees of righteousness. The Hebrew term that is translated trees in English speaks of a very strong tree, like an oak tree, for example. God wants us to be spiritual oak trees, a tree that is firmly rooted. We are called to be trees of righteousness, not tumbleweeds. And as a result of this, we are able to give glory to God. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Jesus was clear in the word 
Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, that every good tree bears good fruit. In fact, he said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Uh, many years ago, Martin Luther said, it's not the fruit that makes the tree good, but it's the tree that makes the fruit good. In other words, if the tree is healthy, if the tree is good, then it will organically produce good fruit. God expects us to bear good fruit. Fruit is non-negotiable in the life of the Christian. Matthew 3 verse 10 says, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Our Lord said in John 15 verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. The New American says, so you prove that you are my disciples by the evidence of fruit, by the presence of fruit in your life. Again, John 15 verse 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me but I chose you and I appointed you, what? That you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. Now, what is fruit? Now, we can look at scriptures that talk about, in James 3.18, it says the fruit of righteousness. Galatians chapter five, uh, verses 22 and 23 says, now the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. All of these things speak of the different facets or characteristics of fruit because it's not the fruits of the Spirit, as some people say, but it's the fruit of the Spirit. But the bottom line is, what is fruit? Fruit is simply this. It is a manifestation. It is the expression of the life that is inherent in the tree. And Jesus says we must bear fruit. But even though that's the case, that he expects us to bear fruit and every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, which is, which is a symbol of judgment and being uh, cast aside from the presence of God for eternity, we have to recognize that our call is not to bear fruit. In other words, bearing fruit is a promise. It is not the process. The process is found in John chapter 15, verse number four, Jesus said this, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now the word abide literally means to stay connected, to be, to remain intact, in other words. And he's saying that just as in the natural, a branch and he's dealing with the metaphor of a, of a common Palestinian vineyard here, as a branch would be connected to a grape vine, as long as that branch is, is intact, then the life that is in the vine flows into the branch, and then the branch just almost effortlessly, organically bears fruit. And so he's saying, focus on that, just staying in constant communion or in fellowship with me. And as you do, my life, because it is the fruit of the Spirit, will flow from me into you, and without effort, you will be able to bear the fruit that I've called you to bear in your life. Hallelujah. Isn't that a powerful truth? That we don't have to bear the fruit. We are called to abide. And as we abide in Him, He promises that we will bear the fruit. Now, the word abide in the noun form is translated abode. An abode is a place of residence. And I'm looking here in John chapter 14, verse number 21, it says, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Jesus is saying, as you love me, as you abide in my word, Remember John 15 verse nine says, we abide in his word and we abide and we keep his commandments and his love abides in us. Then what happens is he's saying, I will manifest myself. I will, I will just appear and I will cause you to experience me and, and to know me personally. And then a couple verses later, verse 23, he says, if a man loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And then he says, and we will come unto him and make our abode.
abode with him. That's John 14, 23. He said, we will come and make our abode with him. The word abode means a permanent dwelling place. In other words, the Lord is saying that he's not content with having, you know, weekend visitation rights. He wants full custody of our lives. He wants to have a relationship with us where we are in constant communion with him. It's not about, you know, just going to church on Sunday, for example, but it's about this ongoing, continual fellowship of the Spirit. That's what God is saying. The key to bearing fruit, the key to seeing the power of God operate in your life, and not just in your life, but through your life in signs and wonders and miracles is constant communion staying connected with the life of God. And how do you do that? You've got to make sure that you're intact. Another way to look at it would be the root system. If a tree in the natural somehow experienced a problem with its root system, you know what would happen? That tree would eventually become malnourished, perhaps um, a disease might set in, and that tree would be incapable of bearing the good fruit that it was created to do. And the scripture tells us that we are to check the root system of our lives. I love this verse. Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse number 16, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If the root of our life are holy, then the branches will be capable of bearing fruit. First, the root, then the shoot, and then we bear the fruit. So we're supposed to have healthy roots, deep roots, roots that are, are healthy and, and firmly planted in Christ Jesus. In the natural, if you think about it, there are two things that will hinder the production of fruit. Number one would be shallow roots. Number two would be diseased or sickly roots. Let's talk a little bit about shallow roots. The remnant, he says, that has escaped shall take root downward in order to bear fruit upward. In other words, he's saying they're gonna put down deep roots. The remnant is a people that put down deep roots. And I want you to be assured, just to be completely confident that the, no matter what you're going through in life, the key to it is to recognize that there is a place that God is calling you to, to go even deeper. Someone has once said that if you can't go forward, then you must go deeper. And this is true. Um, I love this particular passage of scripture in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses seven and eight. And I'm gonna read it to you from the New Living Translation. Paul says, Jeremiah says, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. And literally he's saying in the Hebrew, they've made God their dwelling place, their, their abode, that place of residence that we were just talking about. He said, they are like trees that are planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. A tree planted along the riverbank that has roots that reach deep into the water. The King James says it spread out their roots. And so the idea is no matter what you're going through, no matter how adverse uh, the climate may be, and hostile toward bearing fruit. A tree that is planted by the water always has the significant advantage that water is close. Now the water may have dried up and uh, the water may not be in, in the same closeness of proximity it once was, but a tree has something that is called a taproot. And in the natural, that taproot will dig deeper until it finds that water and locates it and is able to begin to drink from that water again. And in the natural, the truth is, in the, it, that's the way a tree, that's, a tree survives. But when it comes to you, when it comes to me as Christians, the reality is that we are called to bear fruit and the way we do it is by spreading out our roots, by causing our roots to go deeper with God. And as we do, we're going to find that God is there. And so if you can't go forward, go deeper. And the promise is in verse eight, it says such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. They don't have to worry. They're not bothered by the heat. 
It says their leaves stay green and they never stop bearing fruit. That's the promise of God, that if you will have roots that reach deep, deep in Christ, deep in righteousness, deep in his love, deep in his grace, that no matter what you are experiencing in life, there will be a remarkable renewing. You will find that God's grace is sufficient, that he's there for you, and you're able to bear fruit even in the midst of adversity, hardship, and drought. So if it seems that God has shut off the heavens, seems that your prayers are, you know, not getting through to God, I want to encourage you to go deeper with the Lord. And what we're going to do at this point is we're going to just take a break as this session is, is over. And those of you who have your study notes, just look at the exercise at the end of your study notes where it says list five areas in your life that you need to address in order to go deeper in your relationship with the Lord. So write down at least five areas that you feel you need to address in order to go deeper with the Lord. And then write beside them a personal action step that you will take to accomplish your goal. Thank you very much for tuning into this session. This is Glenn Blakeney of Awake Nations Ministries. You can check us out online at www.awakenations.org.